information, okay? You have to write a function in MATLAB that evaluates the function f for your problem. You have to guess the answer. It has built-in values of this. Um, you don't actually have to write this function, and I'll explain this in a minute, okay? All right. Let's say that you have more than one equation, okay? More than one equation and more than one unknown. So here is just depicting um, n equations, whatever n is. You know, 10 equations, 10 unknowns. So again, we like to write that like this. Just put all these functions f into a vector function called boldface f, and then x is a vector comprised of the unknowns, as usual. And we write it like this. Then how do you do this whole Newton-Raphson thing, okay? You understand the old formula wouldn't make sense anymore because the old formula looks like this, right? So now you've got more than one function and now you've got more than one unknown. So now this thing that used to be a scalar, you understand this is a number here, right? You agree with that? You, you find the derivative of the function, that's a new function, you evaluate that at some number called xn and that gives you a number, okay? But now we've got something different because we have a system of equations and a vector of unknowns. So now instead of dividing by this derivative, the, the, everything becomes matrices and, and vectors, okay? So let me make sure that everyone's on the same page here. So this is the, this is the what you call the multivariable analog of the Newton-Raphson method, if you will, okay? So just for the sake of illustration, I'll write the old formula up there. If you want to, you could write the old um, the scalar equation like this. Not partial, sorry. I love partial derivatives. I should probably write xn in there. I knew it. Okay, do you agree that's the, that's the same as the formula I wrote before? Instead of just dividing by the derivative, I'm just saying you multiply by the inverse of the derivative. <laughs> same thing. Okay? All right. So the reason I write it in this way is because it's more easy to see the analogy there. So if, if you have one equation, one unknown, this thing's a scalar. Right? And if you have a scalar, you can just divide by it. But if, if you have, um, if this thing is more than one equation and one unknown, this thing is a matrix. So it's not a scalar, okay? Um, and I'm gonna explain on the next page what that matrix is, okay? Um, and so the, the equation looks like this. So how does this work? Well, first thing you do is you guess the answer. What does it mean, guess the answer? It means guess all these variables. So if you have 10 equations and 10 unknowns, you have to guess all 10 unknowns, okay? That gives you your initial guess. You take this initial guess, you evaluate all these functions here with your guess, okay? That's that. Then you, I'm gonna explain this matrix in a minute. This is a matrix of, of derivatives. You evaluate this matrix, you multiply, these will both be, this will be, uh, right, once we do the evaluation, this will be a vector of numbers, a column vector. This will be a matrix of numbers. You multiply the two and you get a column vector. Subtract that, that from xn x0, right, which is your guess, generate an x1. So it's the same calculation except it's all done with, with um, matrix and vector calculations instead of scalar calculations, okay? All right, so I can tell you the bottleneck here is not this equation. It's not evaluating the function at all these things. It's obviously this, this matrix. This matrix here is a bit of a problem, okay? So what is that matrix? That matrix is perhaps the most famous matrix of all time, okay? That's like a movie entry, you know? Like an introduction to some exciting movie. Makes you want to watch the movie. This makes you want to learn about the Jacobian matrix. All right, so this is a very important matrix in applied mathematics and numerical methods called the Jacobian matrix. Um, I wrote it like that on the previous page. It also gives, is given a name J for Jacobian, okay? And it's the matrix of partial derivatives. So if you look at what it is, the first, right, if you look at the problem before, we, had, we have all these equations, F1, F2, F3. If you look at the first row of this matrix, it's the partial derivative of the first function with respect to all the variables it could depend on. 
It can depend on all n variables, right? So that's the partial of that function with respect to the first variable unknown, second unknown, down to the ne next unknown. Second row is the second function. And you, so you have a row for each function. You have a column for each unknown. Okay. But you remember the good old days, I was even whining back then. I was like, I don't want to calculate the derivative of a function. Right? There was just one function and one unknown. Now you understand, again, if this is, if this is a 10 by 10 problem, 10 equations, 10 unknowns, it's, a, it's a 100 elements in this matrix. So I hope you can appreciate that you don't want to find these things. That's not really practical, right? You say, um, you go into MATLAB and you say, I want to solve this equation. Like you remember that, uh, that problem I gave you at the beginning of class the last time was that thermodynamic problem that we learned you don't really understand, fluid phase equilibria. And there was four equations and four unknowns, two composition, liquid phase composition, two activity coefficients. That would require 16 derivatives. Right, each equation with respect to all four unknowns. So to calculate 16 partial derivatives is pretty onerous and it would keep you from wanting to do this. So I'm going to explain that in a minute. But first point is um, this uh, calculation of this matrix involves most of the effort. So maybe I should, I got to step back a second. Okay. So I should probably pro tell you something to encourage you now that I've discouraged you so much. You don't have to compute this matrix, <laughs> okay? I should probably start with that. All right, you don't have to compute this matrix. MATLAB will compute this matrix for you by finite difference. We, we talk a little bit about finite difference. We talk about numerical methods for differential equations, but um, I'm sure this will be something you can understand with no problem because you basically learned it in first semester calculus. So, I assume you learned this, right? Does that look familiar to you? Yeah, that's a definition of the derivative, right? So, as delta x goes to zero, this becomes the derivative, right? Okay. So, by this definition, you could do the following. You, every time you have a derivative like this, I'll just write one of them for illustration, you can approximate this as like the function at two values in other words, delta x may not be so small so, you know, this is only true exactly the derivative if delta x goes to zero, but if you wanted an approximation of the derivative, you could use this with x being small, but not infinitesimally small. That would be an approximation to the derivative. That's called a finite difference approximation, okay? To be able to evaluate that, you have to know the function f, okay? So the way MATLAB or any other code constructs this, it constructs this matrix for you, God bless them, is they, they just keep calling your function f with little perturbations in x and calculate these difference and approximate the derivatives for you, okay? So that you don't have to do this. Um, so the, the, the upshot of that is that takes a lot of effort, okay? So my experience is if you solve a problem of reasonable complexity, the code will spend 90 to 95 percent of the time calculating this matrix and 5 percent doing everything else, okay? But it keeps you from having to calculate it, which is really nice. Um, now, one thing you know for a lot of problems, so if you, if you go back and you look at the structure of these equations here, okay? So let's say you have five equations and five unknowns. Many of these equations will not depend on all five unknowns. And you'll know that, because you can look at the equation and say it doesn't depend on x3, you can see it, okay? That, so if this function f1 did not depend on x3, that means the derivative of f1 with respect to x3 is guaranteed to be zero, right? It can't be anything but zero. So there's no reason to ask MATLAB to find it for you. So in good codes, you can tell MATLAB all the elements of this matrix that you happen to know are zero. It reduces the complexity enormously because if the problem gets big, 90% of the matrix will be zeros and only 10% will be non-zeros, okay? So you can reduce the computation a lot by telling MATLAB or any other code that you know which elements are zero. Don't bother trying to find them. I know they're zero. Okay? All right. 
So here's a little example just to illustrate how you do this with um, matrix calculations. So we did this, did I do, I think I did this one last time, right? I said I pulled this out of somewhere. <laughs> you guys had your theories, but we didn't want to really get into that. So here's a set of equations. We've got two equations, we've got two unknowns. We want to solve this for x1 and x2. We happen to know, and you can see by inspection, the answer is one and one. Right, if you plug one and one in there, it satisfies the equation. So we know that's the solution. All right, so first thing we have to do, if we want to do this without MATLAB, we have to calculate the derivatives ourselves. So that's the function f1, and that's the function f2. So if we, we have to calculate this set of derivatives, right? We have two f's, we have two x's, so we have to calculate four derivatives. So if you look at the function f1, take the derivative with respect to x1, it's 2x1. Derivative with respect to x2 is 2x2. If you look at the second equation, you take the derivative with respect to x1, it's x2. Right? It's easy. This is trivial, dare I say. By the way, when you guys are seniors, I usually win an award at the senior banquet for using the word trivial the most. So I'd kind of like to keep that going. So if you guys can think about that over the next couple of years. <laughs> you'll have me in control. You'll be really stressed out. You won't understand what I'm saying, and I'll use the word trivial a lot, and that should be all it should take. All right, but <laughs> let's just get the ball rolling now. All right, so, um, so that was really easy to compute, no problem. There you go. Um, so to implement this, I didn't show you all the details because I didn't want to go through all the details, but this is what the equation looks like, right? So x, n plus, so x, you know, is a vector, right? It has components x1 and x2, okay? So there's, this is a vector of two components, a vector of two components. This is that matrix, right? This is the Jacobian matrix I calculate. You have to take the inverse of that. It's easy to take the inverse of this if you want. It's two by two, but I just didn't show it, but it's not hard to do. And um, there's the function f1 and there's the function f2. So in other words, um, let's say I get a guess, okay? So here's a guess, for example. I guess um, 3 and 2, just because I feel like it, okay? So if I guess 3 and 2 here, well, there's, a, there's actual uh, something else I should mention here, is that you have to be a little bit careful. Now you've got a new problem. Remember, it used to be that if the derivative goes to zero, where I erased it, I guess. If the derivative goes to zero, you're in trouble. But now if this matrix becomes singular, now you're in trouble, right? So I remember the first thing I tried was two and two, and that made this matrix singular, right? You might say, well, why would you guess three and two? Why not like two and two or one and one? Because <laughs> I think if you guess two and two, right, this becomes four and four, and this becomes two and two, and that's a singular matrix. It's not invertible. So you have a, you have a problem. You have to be careful about your guess and hopefully you don't get to a position where this matrix actually becomes singular, it fails, just like the derivative failing in the scalar case. All right, with that caveat aside, so what do you do here? So all I did here is I made this guess. So, you know, what do you do? You evaluate this thing at x equal one and two, same thing here, obviously I inverted this matrix. It wasn't hard to do, I used MATLAB to do it. And then it comes back with the next iteration of these two values. Okay, you take these two values, plug it in this equation, then you get these two values, and so on and so forth. You can see after about five iterations, you're here. Okay, now in my world, that's not close to the solution because that's still like a couple percent error. Like, that's not acceptable. I mean, with a little more work, you can get essentially zero percent error. So I, I, I didn't want to show, I didn't want to bore, bore, bore you to death, so I didn't show you the next 10, but I'm going to tell you the 15th one looks like that. Okay, so you're there now. All right. So this ends up being a really robust problem in the sense this is a really horrendous guess. I hope you would agree, right? The solution is one and one, I guess 300, 200. That's a long ways away. Um, but you can see pretty quickly it hones in. Um, it's still pretty far, <laughs> pretty far away. But once you get to 15 iterations, you know, you've got about 0.2% error or something like that. I just got tired, obviously. Um, so if you were to write an algorithm, you know, it'd probably take it another five or ten iterations get really close. But you know, this, so this, it works really well for this problem, um, unlike the direct, uh, fixed point method. Oh man, we got a whole other method? I was hope, kind of hoping we'd get out of here early. You guys would become used to that, right? Last time I noticed I was still talking about five after people started packing up. I'm like, wait a minute. Just like, well, you've, you've established the precedent. We're leaving. Okay. Um, all right. So the secant method, this doesn't take long to talk about. Maybe, maybe 15 minutes will be done. So, all right, so we already talked about this, right? So this thing is what we call the Jacobian. The calculation of this, either if you have to do it by hand, it's kind of impractical for a size of reasonable complexity. 
Um, and to do it with by finite difference, like MATLAB would do, it, it takes a lot of effort. Okay. So for example, if you had a set of equations and you wanted to use the Newton method um, and you had a large set of equations, you know, when you use MATLAB, I think you guys are used to you hit return and you get the answer like 10 milliseconds later. Right? You might hit return and like 20 minutes later you don't have an answer. Right? So the, that's because it's spending all the time evaluating this Jacobian matrix. So what we'd like is a method that's more efficient, doesn't involve the derivative. Right? We'd like to avoid having to calculate that derivative or that matrix of derivatives to Jacobian. Okay? So it's a very simple way to get around it if you want to. It's something called the secant method. So we can approximate the derivative again, this like that kind of finite difference idea. So an approximation of this derivative would be, so again, this n here is the it, what iteration you're at. So if you didn't want to calculate that derivative, you could approximate that derivative like that. Take the difference between the function f at the current iteration and the last iteration, and then divide by the value of x at the current iteration minus the last iteration. Okay, that's like delta f over delta x. Okay, so that's an approximation of the derivative, and now you can plug that in. You remember, for the Newton method, we had this exact equation, then we divided by the derivative. Now, instead of dividing by this derivative, you divide by this approximation of the derivative, and you get this. Okay? So this is called the secant method. I'm not going to go all through the theory of this particular method, but you'll find it has convergence that's not as good as the Newton method. Remember for the Newton method that number was 2. We called that quadratic convergence. People call this superlinear convergence. It means the number is greater than 1 but less than 2. So it's better, like if this was 1, that number they call that linear convergence. 2 is quadratic. So superlinear means it's better than linear but less than quadratics. And you don't know what it is. Depends on the problem. Okay? So it still converges reasonably quickly. Not as good as newton raphs And it's the price you pay for this approximation. Okay? It doesn't come for free. All right. To implement this, um, what do you have to do? Well, you have to guess the answer. But you can see you've got a bit of a quandary here. Because let's say you want to generate um, x1. You have, to, you have to guess x0. You also have to guess something called x minus 1, right? Because if the index n is 1, you need an x0, you need an x, you need an x1. Okay. Well, that's fine. I'll just take x0 and x minus 1 to be the same. Uh-uh. Better not do that because that'll make that singular, <laughs> right? So you've got to pick a value of x0 and x minus 1. Now you need two initial guesses. Um, they better not be the same. Otherwise, this will be singular. So you've got to keep that in mind. I'll go through an example, I assume, right now. Okay? All right. Our favorite, Redlet Kwong. So there he is. Okay? Um, the, you form this function, right? Move P over to the right-hand side. You get this right here. And then to get the iterative equation, um, I don't know why I substituted Vn here. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Sorry. All I was trying to do in this step was something pretty modest. And that was move p to the right-hand side of the equation. And for some reason, I substituted vn here, which I didn't really mean to do. But anyway. Um, and so to do the secant method, we're going to do the following. We're going to generate our iterative equation like this. So we have vn plus 1 there, vn. We have minus the function. Then this is the approximation of the 1 over the derivative approximation. Okay. So just consists of evaluating the function at two values of v and the v, the v like that. It's just, it's just it's exactly that equation with v instead of x. Okay. And there's the function f right there. All right? Well, maybe I did mean to put v in there. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So that's how this would work. And then, did I give it a try? Looks like I did for kicks. Um, so, again, you might say, why did you guess 0.1 and 0.2? I don't know. But I didn't, I couldn't have these two things be the same for reasons I explained, right? Because if those two numbers are the same, the function will have the same value, that'll be zero it, and it will be the singular. So I picked them to be two different numbers. And so if you take these two numbers and plug them in to this, sorry, this equation here, then you will generate a value of v1, right? Now you have a value of v0 and v1 you can use in this equation to get v2 and then you've got v1 and v2 you can get v3. And if you do that it goes a little something like this. Okay, converges pretty quickly. It should. Look how good my guess was. 
my guess like right around the answer. So you'd expect it should work and work pretty quickly. Okay. Um, good. My neck's kind of tired. Um, all right, so what if, this is just trying to show you what if we had more than one equation, um, how would you do the secant method? Well, it's pretty simple. It doesn't look simple, but it is. So there's your system of equations. You want to solve those. There's the Newton-Raphson method, right? It involves the inverse of the Jacobian matrix. We, we, do, we do the secant method because we don't want to calculate the Jacobian matrix because it's a lot of work. So what we're going to do is approximate the derivative um, of, um, instead of actually calculating the derivative. So just to make this point here clear, so if, the, if you have a two by two problem, two equations and two unknowns, then the Jacobian matrix is this set of partial derivatives here. Okay, right? So if we have two equations and two unknowns, you have to calculate these four derivatives. If you want to avoid calculating these four derivatives analytically, then what you're going to do is you're going to do these by finite difference. Okay? So I'll just explain one of these maybe in detail, like this one here. Okay? So this is the partial of the function f1 with respect to x1. Okay? So generally speaking, the function f1 is going to depend on both x1 and x2 in general. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to approximate this derivative by finite difference. And what I've shown you here is the formula to do that. Okay? So it shouldn't surprise you that I'm going to take f1 at some point and subtract f1 at another point. I'm going to divide that by, right? I'm, I want to know with respect to x1. So the numerator of this thing is going to be x1. So I guess the in, notation needs a little bit of explaining. So if you look at this x here, that means which component of x you're talking about and this is which iteration. Okay? So if you want to know the, this derivative right here, okay, first of all, the denominator is going to be two s values of x1 subtracted from each other, not x2, because you're not interested in the derivative with respect to x2. That's where I get this here, okay? x1 of n minus x1 n minus 1. Okay, now what you want to do is you want to know how f1 changes when x1 changes. If you're not interested in this derivative, how f1 changes if x2 changes, okay? because you're not taking that derivative. So what you do, you're holding x2 constant. You see how x2 is the same for both these things and you're just changing the value of x1 here and here. Okay? So that tells you, if I change x1 from this value to this value, how much does f change? That's the partial of f with respect to x1. Okay? If you're interested in how much, for example, does f1 change when I change x2, now you divide by two values of x2 like this and then you implement changes in x2. This tells you how much does the function f1 change when I change x2. Okay, it's in other words partial of f1 respect to x2. Okay, so you can do this for any size system. I thought two by, two by two was more than enough obviously to explain how it works. And so now you can just implement this. So I put a hat on here. Hat is the universal symbol for approximation. Okay, so Instead of having the true Jacobian that I'd get by taking the actual partial derivatives, I have an approximation of it using these kind of finite difference approximations based on the definition of the derivative. Um, so I have four of these guys which are shown explicitly here. And now if I want to do, instead of doing that calculation there, I just do the same calculation but I use my approximation of this matrix instead of the actual one because I don't want to calculate the actual one. I'm lazy. Okay. So just use this, and I don't have an example of this because I got tired, but it sh should work out okay. All right, so we still escaped early, yay. Um, if you uh, have any questions, I'll hang out here. Otherwise, I'll see you Tuesday. And remember, Tuesday, bring computers so we can do MATLAB. <laughs>